Dr. Jason Saunders here with HBOT USA and another video on oxygen toxicity. So again, there are two different types of oxygen toxicity. There is central nervous system oxygen toxicity and then there's pulmonary oxygen toxicity. Both are important, both are real, but both are also very easily avoided when certain procedures and policies are in place to make sure that our patients are safe. There are so many misconceptions and misunderstandings about hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And some of these videos that I'm making, especially this one, is to try to set the record straight so that people have a better understanding of the safety associated with these therapies because they are inherently very, very safe. And I wanna make sure that the people out there know that. And I wanna make sure that doctors out there know that so that we're all coming from the same place. So we covered pulmonary oxygen toxicity in, a, in another video. And today we're gonna to talk about central nervous system oxygen toxicity. And so uh, central nervous system oxygen toxicity has a lot to do with uh, getting, basically getting too much oxygen to our brain. However, it's not that simple. And so what I want you to understand about all oxygen toxicity is it has to do with how much oxygen, in other words, what's the percentage of oxygen we're breathing? The air we're breathing has 21% oxygen. You know, a certain nitrox mix that you might scuba dive with could have 30 something percent oxygen. A hyperbaric chamber might have 21, 80, 96, or 100% oxygen. It just depends on their setup. So it's about the percentage of the air that we're breathing that is oxygen. It has to do with the pressure that we're under, whether we're scuba diving underwater or being pressurized in a hyperbaric chamber, the amount of pressure plays a critical role in this whole process, as does the amount of time. And so we talked about that also in the pulmonary oxygen toxicity that it's, it's a lot to do with time as well as oxygen. And so we, we talk about it as if there's a clock, there's an oxygen clock running and that oxygen clock allows us to be exposed to different amounts of oxygen at different pressures for different lengths of time to create different benefits that we're trying to have, let's say with hyperbaric oxygen, or to, uh, to make sure that we're avoiding some of the consequences. So oxygen toxicity, for the most part, almost everybody can handle a PO2. Uh, you can look up some of the other videos that we did on how to calculate the partial pressure of an oxygen, but just remember it's the percentage of the air that is oxygen multiplied by the total pressure. So if you were at two atmospheres in a hyperbaric chamber at 100% oxygen, you would have a PO2 of two, okay? There are other ways to come up with that that we're not gonna cover today, but just realize that at a, at a partial pressure or a dosage of two as a PO2 of oxygen exposure, most patients can handle that for quite a while. Anything under that, it's almost, I can't say impossible, but it's extraordinarily rare uh, to ever have CNS oxygen toxicity issues at a PO2 below two. And as you get higher and higher, whether because you're increasing the oxygen or because you're increasing the pressure, as you get a PO2 above 2.0, oxygen toxicity, central nervous system oxygen toxicity can become an issue. Now, the other thing I really want to talk about is that there are certain signs and symptoms that a patient is experiencing CNS toxicity, in which case, if you just manipulate the variables that we have control over, you could avoid this entire situation. So one, if you don't go above two, we're not going to be too worried about it. If you're at two or above, then you just need to be aware of the signs and symptoms so that you could either decrease the oxygen, you can give the patient an air break, uh, you could decrease the flow, you could decrease the pressure. These are the variables we have control over in the clinic to basically uh, slow down or stop those symptoms, have the patient recover quickly, and ultimately have no side effects. Um, a particular uh, way we remember the side effects or the, or the possibilities that you know, somebody's being exposed to uh, CNS toxicity, there's a few of these, but vented is one of them. You could have vision changes, ear changes, uh, nausea, twitching, uh, you could have irritability, dizziness, and ultimately uh, could lead to convulsions or a seizure, 
okay? So just being aware that there are signs and symptoms. And like I said, if a patient is getting irritable or dizzy or having changes in their ears or personality, recognize that that might be a sign of central nervous system toxicity. And before there's any issues at all, you could just lower the pressure or give them an air break and you could stop the whole thing from happening altogether, okay? The last thing I wanna bring up is that there's a, a huge difference between the diving world and the clinical world in two ways. One, I, I said earlier, I said, it's, I said this is all about oxygen, it's about pressure, and it's about time. But central nervous system toxicity specifically is not just oxygen, it's also carbon dioxide. And so as our carbon dioxide levels rise, that is the trigger in most cases for oxygen toxicity to really take place. And so why is that different? Because a working diver is literally swimming. They're exercising on some level. And as a result, they have an increase in carbon dioxide output. Patients in the clinical setting are laying down typically relaxing and just breathing. And so their carbon dioxide output is much, much lower. And therefore I bring that up to say that a working diver has a much uh, lower tolerance for oxygen toxicity because their carbon dioxide levels are much higher than a patient laying down uh, in a chamber just resting, okay? But the other thing is that a, a diver, a working diver who potentially has a seizure underwater could very well die. And so oxygen, CNS oxygen toxicity in the diving world has become a huge issue because knowing your limits and understanding the signs and symptoms is literally life or death when you're underwater. And not that we want our patients having seizures in a chamber, but uh, it's not necessarily a life or death scenario. So it's a little less of an acute issue uh, getting all the way to the point where you've worked your way through all the signs and symptoms ultimately leading to convulsions in a chamber versus a diving is a very different phenomenon. However, even in the clinical setting, it is very simple to just be aware of what the patient's experiencing, being aware at the PO2, the pressure and the oxygen levels that they're being exposed to, and just knowing that as we're getting close and exceeding these numbers, we need to be aware of these symptoms and we need to make changes to the hyperbaric environment to avoid this from happening altogether. And as long as we're doing that, it's virtually, uh, very rare to have any of this scenario have to show up as long as we're aware and we're controlling the variables that we can control. So I hope that that's helpful. At this point, we have two videos, one on pulmonary oxygen toxicity, now one on CNS oxygen toxicity. And again, my goal here is not to avoid it. They are real, they're important, and there are consequences when these things happen. So the more aware we are and the more able we are to avoid this, the less worried we need to be that there are problems. But also, I want you to be aware of the fact that both CNS oxygen toxicity and pulmonary oxygen toxicity are very rare occurrences in hyperbaric environments. And like I said, very easily avoidable provided we understand them and we could control the variables that we know we need to in order to keep our patients safe in the chamber. Thanks so much. Talk to you again soon.